Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So we are here talking about the Norman Teardrop or Kite Shield. The first thing I want to mention is that this wasn't known in period as a Kite Shield or a Teardrop Shield. Or as far as I'm aware, as far as I've ever seen any historical sources, it wasn't known as anything specific, it was just known as Shield. And the second thing I want to mention is, whilst this is commonly known as a Norman type shield, not really Norman. In actual fact, it's just kind of a type of shield that became really popular right across Western Europe in the late 10th century, shall we say. And we start seeing it in artwork uh, in various countries, England, France, Germany, in the late 900s, from about 9, 960, 970, uh, 980 onwards. Um, but the reason it's commonly known as a Norman type shield is probably because it appears in the Bayer tapestry. However, what people tend to overlook is that it's not only the Normans using it in the Bayer tapestry, it's actually also the English, the Anglo-Saxons. So why it's called a Norman shield, I don't really know. I mean, I suppose the idea was that Ed Edward the Confessor had spent uh, quite a bit of his life actually in Normandy and uh, perhaps there, well we know there was a fair amount of Norman influence in Anglo-Saxon England uh, before the Battle of Hastings so people have perhaps assumed that this was a type of shield that came to England from Normandy or at least from northern France but of course um, it appears all over Europe so it didn't just come to England it came to the whole of, whole of northwest Europe at that period um, I'll just put the sword down so I, I can gesticulate more effectively. Um, so, first up, the real thing to note about this type of shield is that unlike the earlier boss-held shield, which has a hole in the middle for the handle, this is how predominantly most shields from antiquity onwards were held, with a boss. Uh, Roman shields were held down here, but horizontally, and most later period and most other culture shields tended to be held more vertically or diagonally. Okay? But actually, of course, you can turn the hand uh, dynamically depending on what you're doing. And obviously with a circular shield, there's no real giveaway, unless you can see rivets on the outside that give away which direction the handle's in, whether I'm holding it horizontally or vertically. You can't actually necessarily tell what I'm doing with my hand. Um, but the point that I want to make really is that boss-held shields were predominant right the way up to, um, up to the 11th century. And then, in the, as I mentioned, in the late 10th century, we start to get shields appear that have what we know now as N-arms. Uh, again, we don't know of any, or I don't know of any, um, historical descriptions for this type of shield with straps on the back. If you just ignore this strap for a minute, that's called a guiche, and I'll talk about that in a second. But these are the N-arms, and what you'll notice, if I just take my arm out for a second, there is a pad here. Now what's interesting is there's very little evidence for pads at this period, and there's only some evidence for pads on later shields. In actual fact, it seems a lot of shields didn't have a pad on really, although some did. Um, but what we see with Norman period shields, or 11th century shields shall we say, is generally speaking there are four rivets shown, either on the front, and you'll notice you can see the four rivets in a diamond shape on the front, and of course they come through to the back, and the straps are attached there. Now actually if you look at the Bayer tapestry for example, um, you'll see that sometimes the, um, the rivets are actually one, two, three, four like this and the straps are in a square and invariably the arm in that case is shown going vertically upwards and gripping like that. However, they are also shown going diagonally as well uh, in the bear tapestry uh, in fact but also in other sources also. So there were obviously various ways of attaching these straps, there wasn't one universal way and um, additionally we know that the guiche or essentially wearing a strap um, was also used in this period and very commonly later as well um, with shields and really this serves two purposes one if you're actually holding the shield and you've got the guise on you can you can rest it off your neck and it takes some weight off that shoulder so you can have it hanging there until you're ready for action again and in fact you can just have it hang there and ready and you can get it off your head um, I actually prefer if I'm fighting if I'm sparring with this to not have the guijon, I find it a little bit gets in the way. 
uh, of my sword arm and also just gets in the way of if I want to extend the arm out further. Now, we do have a buckle here. It's very likely that most gis um, had um, adjustable straps like this. This does mean that if I make the strap shorter then I can, and again as shown in the Vea Tapestry, if I make the strap shorter you can actually wear the thing pretty effectively on your back. And this is shown being done by at least one um, Huskarl or the guys with big axes on the Vea Tapestry so they can wear a shield on their back and use a two-handed weapon at the same time, be it an axe or a spear or whatever. Or just use their hands for something else, just if they're marching and want to transport the shield. Um, so there we go, they're the basic characteristics of the Now the main point that I want to mention is a vast number of sources that have talked about the development of this type of teardrop shaped shield um, and its gradual replacement of the, or should we say widespread replacement, not total, never total replacement, the boss held shield never disappeared, um, it just became less common. Um, and most sources that talk about the arrival of this type of shield and the disappearance or, or gradual kind of less uh, popularity of this type of shield say that it's because of cavalry. Now, my main contention with that um, is that it doesn't make sense, <laughs> essentially, for a number of points and I'm going to just list those points, there's not that many. So the thing, the argument that most people say is when you're on horseback, and there we go, so we've got the horse's head coming up here this teardrop shield, the pointed bit down here, protects the rider's leg and so it must have been developed for cavalry and we know that cavalry became a lot more important in the 11th century and debatably in the, in the late 10th century as well uh, with the arrival of, of the Normans and um, their essentially a Scandinavian culture or at least the ruling elite were a Scandinavian culture and they adopted Frankish ways and made cavalry very important. Now. What we've got to remember is that cavalry was very important in Frankish times, in other words in the Carolingian and Ottonian periods, um, by use of kings in, in France and what became France and Germany, they would made extensive use of cavalry. It wasn't like cavalry were a new invention, of course cavalry had been used for centuries. And you know what? All those cavalry for centuries had used round shields, okay? And in actual fact, they continued using round shields in uh, most parts of the world. If we look at Persia or Turkey or Spain or India, um, they continued using round shields. They never felt the need for a long teardrop shield, okay? And they, in most cases, didn't have armoured leg protection, or at least not plate armoured leg protection, and very rarely uh, male armoured leg protection either. So that's the first thing where this argument falls down for me. The first thing is that it doesn't make sense given that cavalry existed before and cavalry existed after and they didn't use these shields. So why would the Normans, in inverted commas, in actual fact the people in the 11th century in Northwest Europe, suddenly feel the need to use this type of shield for their cavalry when no one else ever felt that need? regardless of how much armour they want. So that's the first thing where that argument falls down for me. The second point where it falls down is I don't think this is a very effective, effective cavalry shield. Okay? If you just imagine, I am sitting on my horse here, I'm holding my reins in my shield hand, and yes, my um, shield protects me all the way down to my uh, shin, middle of my shin pretty much, and all the way up to my shoulder. And I've got my lance or my sword, whichever I'm using, Yes, it does offer fantastic protection to me on this side. However, it offers no protection to me whatsoever on this side. This leg might be very well protected, but this leg has no protection and neither does this side of my body. Now, um, you might say, oh, well, I'll always make sure that I attack someone on this side of my horse. Well, quite simply, you can't always ensure that. You can't always ensure that an enemy horseman or an enemy footman is always going to obligingly stay that side of my horse. Yes, I can try and manoeuvre my horse such that they stay on that side and fight them here. But one of the disadvantages to fighting people, let's just grab the sword again, on this side, is whilst I'm defensively very strong, I can defend all parts of my body and I've got my shield here, I can't reach very far. I can reach a lot further on that side than I can on this side. It's the same with the lance as well. Well, it has to be said the lance, especially if it's under the arm, I don't have much angle on this side, whereas I can angle all the way on that side, similar to a bow as well, similar to mounted archery. Um, so, 
Um, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me that you're, yes, you're fully protected on this side, but if I'm fighting someone on this side, I've got no leg protection and low body protection. And because this shield is long, it's pretty much locked on that side of my horse's body and neck. If I want to protect myself on this side, oh god, I can't do it because my horse is in the way. So I would actually argue, this is a rubbish shield for cavalry. Yeah, it will do, you can make use of it, you know, it's a shield, it's better than nothing. But, I don't buy the idea at all that this is a cavalry shield. Round shields, smaller shields, um, in fact, generally speaking, across history and across the world, smaller shields than this have been what's actually been popular for cavalry. Whether we look at North Africa, the Middle East, Asia, wherever we look, smaller round shields because you can easily get them to either side of your body if needs be and you can get them over the horse's shoulders and neck without it hitting the horse. Um, so I don't think this is a very effective cavalry shield. So that's the second point. Okay. The third point is that, and this is a really big one, and for me this is the deal breaker, this shield appears all over Northwest Europe at the end of the 10th century and into the 11th century, regardless of whether they made extensive use of cavalry or not. And we come back to the Bayer Tapestry. The Bayer Tapestry shows Anglo-Saxon English fighting on foot with this. Even when they're using Dane axes, in one case one-handed and in another case two-handed, they have long shields. Secondly, we know that these were used in Scandinavia as well. And Scandinavia and Anglo-Saxon England were cultures which had based their entire fighting style, really, on um, travelling quickly by horse to a location and then dismounting to fight. Yes, there are some possible contentious examples where maybe the English and maybe the Vikings or Scandinavians fought on horseback. However, they're few and far between. They are the exception. The rule is that the English and the Scandinavians fought on foot, and they also used these shields. Now, to me, this is where we get to my, <laughs> my theory. So, for me, this isn't a cavalry shield. It's not well suited to being a cavalry shield. And if we look at cavalry before and we look at cavalry after, they preferred smaller shields, usually round or a small heater shape. Um, so relatively small shields preferred for cavalry because that's what works best on horseback. Um, this shield, I believe, is best developed or best used on foot. Now, if we think about the round shield for a minute. So I think that the kite, the teardrop shield, the kite shield, is essentially actually optimised for fighting on foot, not on horseback. We look at the round shield. We know that um, it was sometimes held close to the body. In shield walls it was perhaps held at a slight angle or flat. But we know from lots of pictorial descriptions that very often when it was used in a one-on-one -on -one fight, it was held out from the body like this. And Roland Vorchecker of Dimakator has done lots of excellent videos talking about this. Okay, so you, generally speaking, will present the front edge forward. Or if it's a domed shield, uh, if we look at Frankish art or indeed Anglo-Saxon art, where the shield is lenticular or domed rather than flat, then very often it's held out uh, like a buckler at arm's length in all the artwork. It's very consistent in that. Occasionally it's held up here actually, but, very, but a lot of the time it's held with the arm extended. And the whole point is your legs are not protected by the shield itself in this case. Your legs are pre protected by geometry, by reach. If I extend my shield out here, for someone to get to my legs, they have to come in very, very close, at which point I can close the line very easily just with a little bit of movement and hit their high line. Just as we see in numerous fencing treatises, we know that if you, hit, if you want to hit someone in the leg, it's very dangerous to your head because you can always reach someone's head before they can reach your leg. So all you have to do is move that front leg back and bam, you can either hit them in the head or the sword arm. Okay? It's the same principle with sword and shield. If a person wants to get to my shield leg, first of all they advance with a shield in their face, bam, at which point I might be able to physically block their sword arm or just hit them in the face. But equally, all I have to do is move that sword leg back a bit and I can hit either their head or their sword arm before they can hit my leg, before they can even in distance to reach my leg. 
That, however, is with a boss held shield because when I hold this out from me, it gives me an incredibly long reach. Okay? Very, very long reach with one of these. It protects not principally by being a wall, but by being a, an extension that's sticking out from my body using geometry. As soon as we switch to the strap shield with N arms, we can not really do that much anymore. Yes, I can hold a shield out here, but you'll notice because it's attached to my arms, it's much closer to my body. What that means is the opponent can now get closer to me before they encounter my shield. So even if I hold the shield out here for an instance, they're still much closer to my leg. So therefore, the shield gets longer to protect my leg. So this is a completely different philosophy to the boss held shield. This protects more with its size and shape, its silhouette, rather than protecting like a buckler with geometry. If we pick up the little buckler here, that doesn't protect at all, really, with its size. You don't wear it like a breastplate or a helmet. It protects by being held out here. Now, if you want to attack my leg, I can just move my leg back a little bit or, and keep that extended and I can now encounter your sword arm and keep myself covered and keep my sword arm covered and hit you back. That protects with geometry by being far from my body. Like an umbrella, the further up an umbrella is from your head, the bigger cone of protection it will give underneath. It's the same principle with the earlier Viking and um, Anglo-Saxon type boss held shield. Okay? We don't get that so much with the strapped teardrop shield. That's why it needs to be long. So essentially it's giving you the ability in a shield wall or a situation where you can't hold the shield out at length like you would do with a round shield to protect your legs. It's giving you the ability to hold the shield closer to your body and your legs are protected by the length. Okay? So for me, teardrop shield Infantry shield, not a cavalry shield. Cheers, guys. Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.